Hi everybody, it's Adam with heartvalvesurgery.com and we're answering your questions live in Abu Dhabi at the Heart Valve Society Conference. I am thrilled to be here with Dr. Rakesh Suri. Many of you know him as the Chief Executive Officer of uh, uh, Cleveland Clinic here in Abu Dhabi. He's also the Chair of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery. What you may not know is that he's the President of the Heart Valve Society. So it is a gift for us to be here with Dr. Suri. We are answering your questions. Dr. Suri, as you may know, is a mitral valve specialist, and this is, a, I think, a great one, given all right. the thing, things that we're hearing about transcatheter technologies. Yes. So Rita Canoose asks, hi, Adam, I just found out I have mitral valve stenosis, and one leaflet is closed, and the other three leaflets are showing wear and damage. I have a prosthetic mitral cow valve from 2008. They are evaluating valve in valve replacement versus full open heart. Can I have more than one valve in valve potentially in another 12 years when this replacement wears out? Great question and thank you for asking it, Rita. The, let's address the concept of valve in valve first. Um, a lot of biologic mitral valves have been put in over the last 20 years. So either cow or pig based, uh, which is okay. Uh, however, the reality is they fail. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a biologic tissue that fails just like anything else, like a knee or a, or a hip or, or, or anything else in the, in the body. It just wears out. But these tissue valves wear out a little quicker in the mitral space, we think because they're exposed to such high pressures. In fact, the chamber of the left ventricle next to the mitral valve is one of the highest pressure systems in the entire body. When they fail, there's a few options uh, left for retreatment. The first is opening the chest again, cutting out that valve and putting in a new valve. The advantage of that is it allows you to put in a big valve and even make a decision to switch between a biologic and a mechanical. And mechanical valves tend to last longer, although they require blood, uh, blood uh, thinning therapy for the rest of your life. Uh, there's another option now, and that is inserting a transcatheter valve through the groin uh, that is crimped or sort of um, folded down. It, it's, it's guided through the vessels into, into the heart itself and placed in the old prosthesis. It's then expanded up and the old leaflets of the valve that was put in 12 years ago are pushed out of the way and this new valve functions within it. That's kind of like taking a car battery that has failed and not removing it from your car, but putting in a smaller battery inside. That's the visual. You can do that a couple of times and then eventually the battery becomes too small to support the body. And that's the same analogy I want to draw here. It's better than the aortic uh, position because the aortic valve that is put in is much smaller. So you're not able to put valve in valve uh, past one or two times. In the mitral space, you have the opportunity to do that. So the size isn't so much the issue. It is what is left, and that's that old valve in place, and we simply don't know. We don't have the scientific uh, uh, data, the length of studies necessary to understand what that means. So technically, absolutely doable. Do we do it in high-risk patients? Yes, which then brings me to the next question. Rita, if you're a low-risk, lower, moderate-risk patient, we would generally say as a heart valve therapy community that you should undergo re-sternotomy or re-operation and heart valve re-replacement because that new valve that we're putting in you is going to be necessary to take you forward for the many, many years of life you have in front of you. If on the other hand, a patient was very, very high risk with a lot of other medical problems that would make re-operation very, very risky, and the patient's not expected to outlive that new valve in valve, then yes, exactly. It's a technically uh, a doable operation. It's feasible. We've done very, very many at uh, Cleveland Clinic and Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, uh, as have other medical centers. So technically doable. We need to sit down with the heart team and understand what your risks and benefits are, outline the indications, and help you make the choice together. Dr. Suri, uh, so thank you for the response. I hope that helped, Rita. I, one question is just as a follow-up is, you have a unique uh, perspective in all that's happening in the valve world, the valve science, the valve research. When you step back and you look at all this wonderful evolution and transformation and maybe even called disruption too, 
What are you seeing today that is really just getting you very excited about where we're at as a, as a community with these technologies? You know, Adam, I'm a big believer in collaboration. I don't believe in anything in life, particularly in medicine, that patients, caregivers, organizations, or society benefits when we put up boundaries or walls or silos. And what I'm most excited about in the Heart Valve Society is for the first time in our history, we are coming together in, in an avid way to understand each other's perspectives, to collaborate and put the patient at the center. It doesn't matter what the surgeon feels is best alone or the cardiologist or the interventionalist or the imager or even the anesthesiologist or, or uh, the radiologist. It's us all together as the heart team, which puts the patient at the center, gives them options and empowers them to make a decision that's right for them. I'm very excited about that because I've never seen that in medicine like we see it today in 2020. Wow, well I just got, uh... I don't know if those are goosebumps or what hearing you talk, but it was very inspiring that you've taken that on and you're trying to create that model here with your team and then scale it to all the folks here that are attending this conference. And I don't know how many people are here. There's got to be several hundred yeah. folks, if I, if I understand it. So the largest meeting ever, and um, we're hoping to approach 600 attendees this year, which is, uh, which is phenomenal, from 56 different countries around the world and counting. Wow. Well, thank you for everything you do, Dr. Sereni. As we always say here, keep on ticking.